Hello everyone. I'm standing in for Chris Dupper Budas uh, for this Tea Time talk today. Uh, my name is Jim Goldsmith and I'm the BCS Awards Officer. We've got a fascinating collection of speakers tonight uh, to give you their memoirs. First up, we will have Mary Spence. We'll then have Andrew Tatham and followed by Henry Holbrook. Could I ask that if you've got any questions, please do put them in the chat, but we'll wait to the very end of the last presentation before we read the questions out uh, for our guest speakers to answer. So Mary, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? We can. It's you yes. up first. So goody, goody. I'll let you introduce yourself and oh, the you. title of your talk, your memoir, you. because uh, it's going to be a surprise to me too. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. See you soon. Okay, right. Remembering the fun stuff. I was think oh, I spent ages and ages trying to work out what my map when Mars would be. And I had to go right back to the very beginning. And there's been a pattern emerge over the decades that I actually loved working on atlases. So I'm going to focus on atlases throughout this talk. The main reason I loved atlases is because you get a bit of everything there, but mainly because I just love topographic mapping and doing something clever with data, making pretty diagrams and such like, and trying to convey a good message over to the user. So let us begin. Oh, I would begin if I could begin, yes, hang on. There we go. Um, chronology, I joined Pergamon Press in 1972, and that's a long time ago. This will be my 51st year in making maps. Phew, it feels like it as well sometimes. My first job at Pergamon Press was working on a secondary school atlas of Malaysia. Sadly, I haven't got any images to show that because um, I didn't have a copy of the Atlas when we left. Um, Pergamon Press was closed down by Mr. Maxwell in 1974, and I left and joined David Fry and Company in Henley, where the first, I did lots of work there, and my first job ever was working on Milton Keynes' new city map, but the first Atlas I worked on there was Nelson's Atlas 80. Now I've got a picture of that coming up later. 1982, David Fry and Company was taken over by the Lebanese and the start of Arab world publications, principally atlases in the first edition. And we produced many, many secondary school atlases, mostly in Arabic. Well, sorry, the atlases were all in Arabic. The sheet maps and wall maps were in various languages. And then 2002, I joined Global Mapping and that was the first digital foray for me. So let us begin at the beginning of atlases. My very working at Pergamon Press, my very first influence was Pergamon World Atlas, the granddaddy of atlases of the, of the Pergamon stable. And you can see from the image I've got there, the detail of the thematic mapping it was particularly appealing. It was attractive, the colors, the symbology, um, everything had a, it had a bit of everything, graphs, diagrams, beautiful drawing. I loved it. And that influenced everything thereafter. But when I joined um, David Fry and Company, I was going to say Geo Project there, but it wasn't then. <laughs> I joined David Fry and Company. I was introduced to European atlases, and they fascinated me because of their colour. And there were a couple of publishers that actually appealed to me mostly. And it's only in recent times I've realised that um, the famous Ferion Ormeling was editor of the Boss Atlas in Netherlands at the time. And it's only with hindsight I realise how much he influenced me with my colours and the quality of cartography. The next one is another foreign atlas, another European atlas, the Deer Kvelt Atlas, which again had lots of colour, lots of symbology, in other words, quite pretty mapping. But one of the most influential ones for me was Imhoff and his Swiss atlas. And here I've got an atlas of the middle school, which shows just the awesome cartography that was involved in there. 
And again, a very, very difficult subject to make clear, but I think you'll agree everything there is, for, is perfectly understandable. My first atlas um, that I worked on was as an editor, we're talking about being editors here, um, was Atlas 80, or Thomas Nelson and Sons. And it's a junior atlas, and you can see it's got very naive type of um, depiction, very 70s, I suppose, and it's rounded corners, which have made a comeback, I see, but um, very bold colours. And the ethos of this was that it was very simple for younger children to understand. What perplexed us at the time and caused some friction between us and the publishers was the fact that every country in the world had to have a different colour. Now you can see on that example on the screen that there are very subtle differences, which doesn't make it very clear, but we had to stick to that every country has a different colour. Next was uh, going up a grade into secondary school and a whole lot of other um, qualities introduced here, which was the Phillips Atlas series, I worked on loads of them. Um, and this is an example of the sort of stuff that we did there. Um, and again, I was just editorial work here, um, designing, colouring and so on, getting the maps, all under the direction of the editors at Phillips. And if you read the bit of text on the right, you'll see some illustrious names there. Um, Bill Willett, Harold Fuller, who I believe was a founder member of the society. David Gaylord, who went on to be the big boss at Phillips. And those were back in the days when the editors' names were listed. And if you look closely enough, you'll see that I'm in there. Much to the amusement of my niece, who, when she was at secondary school, called me at one day and said, hey, hey, Mary, is that you that's in this atlas? And I was proud to say, yes, it was me that was in the atlas. Then came the Arab world. That's when my life changed somewhat. I had to learn all the new rigours of a different publisher, a different country of publishing. And you can see there the wide variety of products we did. Um, and I just point you to the top right hand corner there, the map of Syria. That's from one of the school atlases. And the significance of that you'll see on the next slide. That is an extract from a rather battered copy of a map I've got of the Middle East, political map. And you can see that Syria is fine, it's blue. But when you see this map of Syria, you realize that that bit in the top left, um, the Iskandarian Peninsula, as we used to call it, doesn't really belong to Syria. Again, it doesn't belong to Turkey either. So it, doesn't belong, it does belong to Turkey in that map. But in the Arab world, no, the Ottomans took over and it was a French mandate that then gave that bit of Syria to Turkey, but the Arabs didn't like that. So being working for an Arab publisher, I had to stick with that. There's another feature on here, which um, was rather contentious. And as an editor, you always try to get everything right to the best of your abilities. And to put Palestine on the map when it was Israel, was a bit of an odd one, but we had to obey orders. You can see on this next one, this is a page from the Atlas, from the secondary school at this, where all the maps show the whole of Israel and West Bank, Gaza, etc., all as part of a country called Palestine. Oh well, <laughs> it, it really gets funny when you come to the thematic mapping, and this is just a couple of spreads from a different series of atlases. Um, and I draw your attention to the one on the top left, which is citrus fruits. Um, and it was at this point that I started to kick up a fuss, really, and uh, got in touch with the director and said, look, this missing off Israel altogether is crazy, because at that time, Israel was the largest producer of oranges in the whole of the Arab world. We all know about Jaffa oranges. Well, we weren't allowed to put on the pie diagram. And if you look at the other countries, there are pie diagrams for every one of the Arab world countries, but not for that area that we call Palestine, we call Israel and they call Palestine. So it was all very geopolitical, but we just had to go with it. And um, we were able to concede that instead of ignoring it and having a big hole in there, we were able to put on 
distribution of things like so that's why you've got a few lemons stuck on there and grapes and bananas and the like but we weren't allowed to quantify it in statistics the next that this I worked on was for Oxford University Press again editorial work um, and the reason I pick Australia was because in the throes of <laughs> deadlines the draftsmen weren't keeping up so I was very proud to be allowed to do the tight patching on the Australia pages and that's okay I think um, I might improve it nowadays after I've done more hands-on stuff but that was the first time I got down and dirty with handling the materials. The next one I worked on was the most in impressive one that I can honestly say I've ever worked on and um, it was with David Drury from Scott Puller Research Institute um, it was the, as you can see, the geological and geophysical folio for Antarctica. It was all still drawing manually, so it was a heck of a job doing all the compilation for the diagrams and the key lines and such like. Um, but it was such a challenge and I just loved doing it. I looked everywhere online for images of it, but there weren't any. So I had to climb up in my dusty attic, dig out my battered old copy of it and get Graham to do some photographs for me. So thank you, Graham. Another atlas we worked on was for Uni um, Oxford University Press again, but it was the Atlas of Wales. Um, and it's, I wasn't involved particularly much in this one, apart from just checking that the draftsman was doing a good job. But it's a huge tome in a box with lots of loose leaf extracts. Again, this is a photograph of one of the pages because you can see the wide variety of mapping that you'd be involved with with atlases. Now coming on to the biggest atlas I was in charge of, which was the National Atlas of the United Arab Emirates. And I picked the Dubai map um, particularly because it shows how it was then, long time ago, um, before it was developing. I remember visiting Dubai um, to discuss the project with them um, and they were building the Palm Beach Jamara Hotel, um, which was very, very fun to see, but oh my goodness, it's changed somewhat since then, has it not? These are a few of the examples of maps from that atlas. Again, I had to dig it down from my dusty attic. Um, and you can see there's thematic mapping throughout, which, oh, there's 180 odd pages in there. You might notice from these images that there's nothing on the left-hand side. That's because um, the University of Elaine, who commissioned the Atlas, wanted the Atlas to be as prestigious as possible. Um, so we decided if we only print on one side, that will double the size of the Atlas. So they were happy to go with that. The first time I actually got into the working of the drawing of Atlases was when we were commissioned to do the geology of Saudi Arabia. Um, so a hardback book with lots of maps in it. Um, I've just chosen a couple of random illustrations there. And then nine little booklets with maps of, and detailed descriptions of what to go and look for. So that was fun getting started on those. And that was my first foray, as I say, into actually drawing maps on my computer all by myself, compiling them and then drawing them, which was fun. Then we came to... Um, again working for global mapping um, we were commissioned by Millennium House to work on some maps for a series of atlases the first one was Earth Blue um, then the geological one where I did editorial work again on just and lots of geological maps extracts and detailed stuff and then the culmination of Gordon Cheer's dream was to produce Earth Platinum which is the biggest book in the world um, and I'll show you some images from there. There he is, proudly standing by it. That was the launch at the British Library. So you can see just how big the thing is and how proud he is. He's, he's standing there, opening the book at the page I actually worked on. And now I did get down and dirty on this one. I did have to do some revision because again, things got very close to deadline. And instead of me just doing the editorial work saying, oh, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Well, if you want that doing, says they, you have to do it for us. So I did, great fun. And then here I am standing proudly by another page that I did at the British Museum lunch. 
Now that is a very quick whistle stop tour of the sort of stuff I've done. But I thought being map memoirs, I suppose I ought to introduce what is my favorite map. Although you're all gonna say this isn't a map that I'm coming up to. But to me, it is fabulous because it crosses all sorts of disciplines into something that you, most of you won't comprehend as being possible. What you're looking at there is a glass globe. There are cameo glass where one layer is on top of the other. You may all be familiar with wedge cameo brooches and the like. Well, this is the glass equivalent of it. So what you've got there, and I've got a close up at the bottom, is a pale grey opaque glass, which um, underneath with a coat of white on top and a coat of red on top of that. Now, each of these layers is dunked in the glass, the molten glass, ground away where you don't want the images to the white to be, and then ground away where you want the red to be. And it's absolutely exquisite. And I think you can see the different layers on the piece at the bottom. And it's housed in the Starbridge Glass Museum, which was officially opened by HRH, the Duke of Gloucester yesterday. And that's where we were. And I saw this there and it reminded me, I just had to share that one with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, I would remind everyone, do please put your questions in the chat. Uh, fascinating. I've got a couple of questions for you later, Mary, so I'll, I might not type them, I might just ask them anyway. Okay. Um, absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. So our next speaker is Andrew Tatham. Right, Andrew, whenever you're ready to go. All right. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Um, intriguingly, uh, I also spent some time with George Philip and Sons as a, a cartographic editorial assistant in my case. Um, that was in the time of Harold Fullard. Uh, so that goes back a week or two. Um, but in 1973, I moved to become college map curator at King's College London. And I've chosen just one map from uh my time there uh it uh, will be quite a significant contrast to the ones that mary's shown you um the cover of it is here i hope so this um this is the map that i'm going to be talking about in uh, a little bit uh, but i think i ought to set it in some sort of context first uh, as I say, uh, this is uh, an aspect in my uh, cartographic life, and I suppose I'd call it the title down a tactile memory lane. Um, this particular map, I'm delighted to say that I had absolutely nothing to do with its uh, design or production, uh, which is probably why it's such a good map. Uh, I'll come on to the aspects of design and production in a while because it is a significant cartographic achievement. But as I've hinted, I've also chosen it because it acts as something of a marker of a significant period in my cartographic life. I was a map curator at King's College and when I returned home one day in 1987, my wife Margaret, told me that she thought I could fill a role that had been discussed in the radio programme, Does He Take Sugar? The programme was a weekly news and comment slot made for and by blind and visually impaired people. And the task was to create a catalogue of tactile maps that were becoming increasingly available to blind people, or at least they would have been available to blind people if they'd been able to learn of their existence, hence the need for a catalogue. After some discussions with my head of department and with the RNIB and others, I started the project and indeed over the years produced two editions of the catalogue. All uh, print versions, we're still in uh, uh, antique times here. I started the project uh, the, the work, sorry, led on to some very interesting discussions 
with the Joint Committee on Mobility for Blind and Partially Sighted People at London Transport. This was part of their work on accessibility. And a year or so later, one outcome of this was the creation of an experimental standardization for tactile maps of underground stations. This was done by a Hungarian PhD student called Joseph Biro, whose time at King's I was supervising. And coincidentally, this was just at the time when the ICA was forming a commission on tactile cartography, later the Commission on Maps and Graphics for Blind and Visually Impaired People, and was calling for members. Chris Board, who was then our UK delegate at ICA, suggested that because of my interest, I should become the UK member of the Commission. And I that happened in 1988. Subsequently, I also became chair of the commission. And this was a start of a very interesting period for me, <clears throat> not just in tactile cartography, but being involved with the ICA General Assembly every four years, including one that the UK National Committee hosted in Bournemouth back in 91, with biennial international cartographic conferences, as well as commission meetings and training events across the world, I had the opportunity of meeting cartographers from the whole breadth of the subject. It was a time of innovation and discovery in practice, as well as in theory, and I learned much from these international contacts. Some of the developments at the time were serendipitous, as when Don Parks of the University of Newcastle, New South Wales, was sent a singing Christmas card, which led via quite a bit of experimentation to the development of Nomad, a touch sensitive mapping system, overtaken quite quickly, it has to be said, by uh, touch sensitive screens more generally. Some of the discoveries were distinctly challenging, as the comment by a teacher of blind children in Tanzania, who said his first job at the beginning of term was to go around the villages uh, that fed into his school and find the blind children because they were being hidden away to avoid the family being stigmatized. Blindness, it was thought, was a punishment from God for something that they, the family, had done wrong. Anyway, having set this period in the context of my own career, I turn now to setting it in the context of tactile mapping. Tactile mapping had begun in the 19th century with 3D models, originally individually created from wood, string, and other materials. Following the development of thermoformed plastic, 3D relief maps, which were being created from the 60s, I think, for the broad educational market, tactile maps became, began to be made be using the same technology. And this, of course, allowed mass production rather than every individual map being a, a unique item. There were difficulties particularly for those who were blind from birth, in such matters as scale. On being shown a 3D relief map of southern Germany made at the time of the Munich Winter Olympics, one user felt the smooth northern slopes of the Bavarian Alps and said, oh yes, I can feel the ski jump slope. Of course, scale is not just a hurdle for blind map users and many tactile products actually provided benefits for sighted people as well. One such was a set of tactile strip maps of the Washington Metro lines, created by Professor Joe Weedell of Maryland University, my predecessor as commission chair. These tactile maps became so popular with sighted Metro users that his team couldn't keep up with producing them and had to produce a print version uh, to be made available alongside the original tactile version. These strip maps were still thermoformed, uh, 
but now using Braylon, a much more malleable plastic than that used for the traditional plastic relief maps. Braylon gave map makers much greater freedom in the development of tactile symbology, but a 3D master was still required and the actual thermoform machine, which required both heat and the creation of a vacuum to form the mold the braille on over the master was neither cheap nor particularly portable. In parentheses, we may note that the traditional plastic relief continued alongside braille on, not least because it could be pre-printed in color, provided sighted carers and assistants with the possibility of more easily helping the blind user. And if the colors used were discriminable on the grayscale, it could also be used by those with color blindness. The next development on the materials side was the microcapsule paper. This was paper sub substrate coated with microcapsules filled with alcohol. If a black image was drawn onto the surface and then the sheet was exposed to UV light, the black areas absorbed the energy causing the alcohol to boil, not enough to drink, I can tell you, and those capsules to expand, creating a tactile image. Production became both lower tech and quicker, and a large number of maps were created, particularly of town centers, shopping centers, and similar spaces. Because of this explosion of interest, much of the work of the International Commission was in communicating possible solutions and good practice, as well as trying to prevent too many reinventions of the wheel, having to explain to enthusiastic uh, people taking it up that there were fairly basic notions of, uh, uh, of cartography, disabusing them of ideas like that of having one simple map set, sorry, one single set for all maps, an impossibility, of course, even for printed maps, and completely out of the question if you wanted to have tactually discriminable maps. This matter of tactual discriminability brings us to the most significant difference between regular cartography and tactile cartography, and that is the acuity of the sensor. The human eye is capable of distinguishing very small features a fraction of a millimeter across but the human fingertip is much less sensitive. Thus, the tops of points on a, a braille cell, and you can see a, a line of braille just below the uh, white title of this atlas, uh, of this map. The tops of the cell uh, of the points are two millimeters apart, a distance that was scientifically confirmed more than 100 years after the emergence of Louis Braille's system. In Braille, each letter in the alphabet is represented by a combination of up to six points in a cell measuring four by six millimeters, with a space of two millimeters between one cell and the next. As I say, you can see that quite clearly at the bottom there. <coughs> While there are ways of denoting catalyzation and italicization and contra contractions, that's to say, single cell patterns for common letter groups like TH or ING, as well as systems for non-Roman scripts. There's no, familiar, uh, no facility at all with Braille for changing the font size or even the font itself. It's as though as every word is set in 24 point times Roman. The cartographic challenges do not end there, however, because not only does text have to be tactually discriminable, but so do all the points lines and areas on a map, implying at least a two millimeter buffer around each symbol. Furthermore, the supposedly obvious solution of just make it bigger is not a practicability. When users are exploring a tactile map, they anchor the little finger on one edge. With both thumbs touching, the hand spread then determines the maximum size to the map or diagram. In respect of its size, therefore, and I now am moving to the next slide, uh, the London Underground map is pretty much at the upper limit. You'll see that it's produced on two sheets, standard sheets of Braylon, giving an overall size of 25 by 50 centimeters. 
And immediately you can see how the constraints I mentioned just play out. This uh, map shows just the central part of the London Underground map within the circle line. This is the old style map with the central line running straight across the, the center. Uh, this is a, a more modern one, but it still, you can see the area, uh, it's just the middle part within the circle line. On a printed map, this uh, would perhaps come up to eight by four centimeters. Uh, and if you're using one of the uh, underground maps printed on the fly leaf of a pocket diary, of course, it's much smaller than that. Indeed, if you wanted a tactile map of this whole underground system, it would probably be around the size of a wall map. It would look pretty impressive, but it would be virtually useless and actually unnecessary. Once, as the Washington Metro maps clearly demonstrated, once you are out of the central area, the tactile cartographer has to have a very clear, um, sorry, the, once you're out of the central area, the requirement is really much more about knowing how many more stops it is to your destination and whether the platform is going to be on the left side or the right side of the train. Even more therefore than with any other form of cartography, he says boldly, the tactile cartographer has to have a very clear understanding of the purpose that the map will serve. And therefore, exactly what information is necessary and what information must be discarded. If we move to look in more detail at the uh, map, we can see how very well Brian Law, let's go back to the map, how, how very well Brian Law, who the creator of the map and the at that time the RNIB coordinator of maps and graphics, has overcome the challenges that the medium presents. If we move to a detail piece, uh, the central line running across uh, towards the top of your screen and the city branch of the northern, uh, the west end branch of the northern line running down the left hand side, and then the circle line uh, towards the bottom with the uh, dots, uh, dotted symbol. That's the thing, here is the um, legend sheet. I'll come back to that previous map in just a moment. Um, there are actually 13 tactually distinct line symbols. 12, 10 to 12 is usually regarded as the maximum possible. On the current Transport for London map, there are 18 line symbols. And if you go to something like the standard Pathfinder, it's somewhere more in the region of 30 line symbols. Going back to the detailed map, you see how the line symbols can and do work together and do not overload the user's capabilities, largely by limiting the number of other symbols ju to just two sorts of point symbols, the ovals or circles for interchange stations and the simple bar for intermediate stations. Each station has a two letter uh, code for its name. So down here you'll see WL for Waterloo uh, and uh, you can work out all the others because you know the area so well. But uh, this, this little one here is the old Aldwych branch which actually ran underneath King's College uh, and uh, demonstrates one of the a, a use of the contraction. So that symbol is ALD uh, and that is W, or that's A, W for Aldrich. Um, 
in the years since my involvement, tactile cartography, indeed cartography as a whole, has been challenged enormously by yet more technological development. But I'm enormously grateful for the opportunities that involvement with tactile cartography gave me, not least, I have to say, in international travel. But perhaps I should finish by giving you a similar challenge to the one that we, that's to say Chris Board, Peter Lawrence and I, used to pose to our third year students taking the joint Kings and LSE cartography option. The challenge is to design a map for a specific task. For the students, we use the pedestrian route between Kings and the LSE across the Aldrich. That this map will need to be in black and white. It will need to be A4 in size. It will need to use only Times Roman 24 point uppercase lettering. It will need to have a legend that includes no more than 15 symbols, including all the points, lines and areas together and that has every symbol on the map having a buffer of at least two millimeters round it. I suggest that this little exercise will give you an insight not just into tactile map de design, but into cartographic design in general, as well as being, I hope, an enjoyable challenge. Thank you for your attention. That's absolutely fascinating, Andrew. Thank you very much. So do I do remind you to put questions in the chat. I put one in there for later on. Um, so for Andrew, we have our last speaker of tonight's uh, map memoirs, and that's Henry Holbrook. Are you there, Henry? And there I am there. here, Jim. Yep. <laughs> right, let me share my screen and get going. Okay, then. super. Thank you very much for inviting me along to tonight's uh, Tea Time Talk. Um, I'm really honoured to be taking part in it. It's been fascinating, the series so far. Um, compared to the other talks, my, mine might seem a little bit mundane, actually, but I think it'll give you a bit of insight into how I got into cartography. So uh, hopefully you'll find it enjoyable anyway. So when thinking about map memoirs, I really have to think back as to why I got so interested in maps themselves. So I had to go back to my childhood, essentially think what it was that really inspired me with maps and for me and it still is today actually I'm really inspired by books and actually seeing maps in books was a big big thing for me maps in books allowed me to explore and understand reality in the world around us so for example one of the first things I remember was looking through an atlas and getting to understand the countries and the world and where everything was and making it familiar to me I thought that was a really big thing, actually, to understand what was going on. But not only that, one of the big things I found during childhood was fiction books that actually contained maps themselves. A really good story usually started off with a nice map at the start of it that could be referred to throughout the story. So they really do allow us to imagine and create when we're reading these books. I think that's a really important thing to do as a child. Some of my favourites, actually. Um, Winnie the Pooh, for example, contains a great map. This is by H. Shepard, that the original artwork was recently sold. But that idea that Christopher Robin had all these places that he used to visit, and we could, we could actually visit them ourselves on the map. I really like that idea. It really inspired me. Another example was that of... Arthur Ransom and his stories, such as Swallows and Amazon, Peter Duck, We Didn't Mean to Go to Sea, they all started off with a brilliant sketch map at the start of the book. And all throughout the story, I would always refer back to the map and see whereabouts in the adventure we were actually going. I think that's a really important part of a good book. One of my favorites, not a map as such, but more of an illustration, that of Beano Town. This is, was one of of my first Beano annuals. I love the idea that I could look at Beano Town and where these characters actually live. For example, Roger the Dodger living in his house of Dodge books opposite the Bash Street School. I love that. But I thought the illustrations really helped with that idea of um, sense of place and where people actually live. 
And the nice thing about the simulator was the back cover of it actually had a nighttime scene of that same area as well. So a lot of fun. And that's the thing, a lot of fun can we have with maps too. And more recently, not really during my childhood, but the books I read during my late teens, um, that's Harry Potter and the Marauders map. That idea that you could look at Hogwarts Castle and know exactly where everyone was, basically an interactive map on paper. And you could see the labels of where people were. For example, Albus Dumbledore walking around in circles in his office. I thought that was really magical, as it should be with Harry Potter, really. But I'll go back to that first statement that I said about maps in books that allow us to explore and understand reality. And this thing was a really big thing for me, actually. And there's one reason for that, to be honest. It was to do with my dad. He spent a lot of his time on the road in a blue transit van going all around the country. And this was well before the days of sat nav and mobile phones. And there was always one thing that he took with him and something that he held in really high regard. And that was his Collins Road Atlas. The one that I actually remember was far earlier than this. It had a yellow cover on it. But my dad used to go everywhere with it. He used to plan his journeys with it, had post-it notes all throughout it, and pieces of paper planning his journey that was going to take the following day. My dad always found this um, map book to be really important. And whenever anybody else bought him a different part of map book, he was never satisfied. It always had to be the Collins Road Atlas. And that was his Bible. So, of course, I really was interested in this book. Why was it so important? And I started to explore it and love the colours and symbology that was used within it. It was really bright and obviously inspired me as a child. And after a while, it meant that I could then take my pens and pencils and create my own maps based on the symbology of the map book. And I used to spend hours just creating maps on pieces of paper, all with this symbology that had come from the Collins Road Atlas. But that itself, I wasn't happy with. Of course, I wanted a map book of my own, not just to refer to my dad's map book. So what happened? Along came a blue Peter bring and buy sale at my school. And of course, what did I come across? But some sort of map, but not, not just any map. This was the Reader's Digest AA New Book of the Road. It was completely outdated when it was at the bring and buy sale. But as soon as I picked it up, I just had to have it. I loved the idea that it was different to my dad's map book. It didn't look the same and it didn't feel the same. To me, it held far more detail and was displayed in a completely different way. A lot more subtler colours, for example. But not only that, although it is outdated and probably sat its life in a Nost and Allegro that was falling apart, it didn't matter to me, really. The book itself was quite different from anything that I'd seen before. It was a long, thin book, which was completely different to my dad's Collins Road Atlas, which seemed huge at the time and was really difficult for me to hold as a child. This was quite a nice size. And once it was opened up, it created a nice square map that you could refer to, which I really liked. The maps themselves seemed far more clearer and had a lot more detail compared to my dad's map book. It meant that I could explore more of the country and the world around me. It had this really new, unique feature that I'd not seen anywhere else before. This idea that you could actually fold out the pages to give extra insight into the map that was being shown. And you could do that on both sides of the map. So the left hand side is folded out here, fold out the right hand side, and it actually gives you information about the place itself. Obviously, being Reader's Digest, it had loads of information that was included. But I particularly liked that you could look at the history of the place as well as what was being shown on the map itself. It really inspired me and got me interested in different places that are not heard about. And I liked it that in the fact that the map itself actually had this idea of, um, and instructions on how to use it as well. So it told you how you could actually plan your route. So when you first open the book, you come to this almost square map essentially. You open the right hand flap and that gives you the information that was about the place itself, which reduces the map size. Then open the left hand flap, basically increases that 
real estate of the man up at that square says when you first opened the book. It was really quite clever. I love that the, it, the map had these facts that you could refer to. And obviously the readers digested as well, because they actually patented this design. The biggest thing for me was that I could follow a route from page to page without losing my place, something that I couldn't do with my dad's Collins Road apps. As soon as you turn the page, you had to retrace the route because the part of the map was duplicated on the next page. Whereas I liked how Reader's Digest had actually thought about that in the production of this book. So really, what thinking about this map, was it form over function? Well, I don't think so, because the function of it seemed to be well thought out and planned, for example, as well as the form of it. It seemed to have a lot of design concept in it. Um, I think there's always this misconception that less is more. Actually, I really liked that this map had lots of detail in it and it was displayed in a clear way. So for me, less, less wasn't more at all. I liked all the detail that's been presented. But in particular, it gave me a sense of place. I started to understand distance and the familiarity with places around me. And I could start making that connection between the two places and that geography of where things actually sat. But it also made me learn about new places that I'd not heard about before. And it got me thinking about what places were like uh, based upon the descriptions that were given with the maps and what I could see on the map itself. So I'm just looking at the map here. Not only did it contain these nice clear maps that I particularly liked, it also had the more detailed uh, city maps in the, the individual streets, as well as building level maps. And like I say, this, is, this example being uh, Edinburgh, it was completely out of date, but I still loved it that I could actually see individual buildings and places identified. And then it had more unusual sorts of maps as well. The motorway networks, for example, being depicted as single lines, but detailing all the junctions that went off them. And this was quite novel to me. I had not seen anything like this display before. And it was all contained within, the, within this one map book too. But not only that, like I say, it got me thinking about places that I'd not been to before. And it wasn't the case of less is more, because in actual fact, when you looked at the symbology used, there was a lot on these maps that were quite neatly placed and used within the maps themselves. It almost became my where's Wally of map books. I loved spending hours looking at these maps and actually pick, picking out these individual features, in particular the lighthouses around the coast. But the map was full of different symbols for different things. And I thought, actually, they were really well designed for what they were, and, and it worked really well for me as a map. As well as that, further on in the book, it contained more illustrative maps of popular places, uh, forest places, for example, this in the Peak District. There's a whole series of these. And the maps were surrounded by information, which really allowed you to learn about the places that were being described. Not only that, further on in the book, it had other pages that were full of interesting information, such as trees and plants and flowers. And one of my favorites was canal locks and how they actually worked. So not only was I able to trace the route of the canals on the main maps themselves, but then refer to these pages and look at how they actually worked. It was brilliant as a child to be able to use this almost as a reference book. One of my favourite pages, my battered copy, always falls open at this Farming in Britain page. It just shows that I was, I was always interested in farming from a young age. And then it had the more traditional things such as the highway code. Again, a page that I really loved because I knew that these symbols I could see through the car window. But in actual fact, it was really well designed and probably um, got my interest in graphic design as well. And then also included in the map book was basic mechanics. Wouldn't it be nice if all cars nowadays could have a map book in them which told you what would happen if there was any problems? And that was first aid too. So it was a really well thought out book in what it actually presented. And at the beginning and end of the map book, 
it had this fold out page which gave you an indication of the whole of Great Britain. So it allowed me to see in one single glance exactly where different places were. So I thought this was a really nice feature for the starts and end of the book. So it's during my research uh, for this uh, presentation that I stumbled onto Amazon and I found that actually there's a copy of this book for sale. But not only that, somebody had actually bothered to leave a review about this long forgotten book. And I have to completely agree with the review that was given by Liam where she said she read it from cover to cover on long family car journeys. And it's a wonderful accessory to then 1970s books like a camper van nowadays. Completely agree with that, it really is. But I've never really thought about who actually made this book. I always knew that the, the data within it was based upon ordnance survey mapping. I never took the time to actually explore who the carpenters were. And it was only for the purpose of this talk I actually discovered within it, it does say that the carpenters were Perry Surveys Limited have been head. So that got me thinking about who these actually were. And a bit of Google searching got me to this website, um, fairyservice.co.uk, and I'd really encourage you to have a look at this website, actually. It gives a whole history of the organisation. It originally started off in 1923 as Air Surveys in Burma, before spending many years uh, being called Airy Surveys, where they had an extensive um, surveying programme using aircraft. And 1980 was taken over by Clyde Surveys, but it spent almost 70 years from start to finish before it became a subsidiary of engineering company Halcro, and eventually it disappeared. But this website has been set up and is dedicated to with all the um, former employees of the, of the company. So in actual fact, when I contacted them, they were really encouraged to hear that I'd, I'd stumbled across their website and was really interested in it. It contains such things as even the staff uh, newsletters that were sent out at the time that the company was really active. So it really does give a in good indication of what was happening. And it's a really good archive of information. Uh, and there's a great section on the drawing office that was, um, and some of the photos that are available on the website as well. It really is a fascinating uh, website to look at. So yeah, I'd really encourage you to take a look. But just summarising what I actually think of the uh, Reader's Digest AA New Book of the Road. Well, to me, it's far more than just the map itself. It contains a wealth of information, and it really was a good educational resource. It's more than a disposable publication. So I think um, road atlases, we tend to see as this thing that is produced annually and it's quickly out of date, whereas this seemed to be a much more well thought out publication. It's really nostalgic as well. Technology has really changed our interactions with some of our paper products, and especially road atlases, where we're more reliant upon a mobile phone rather than a paper product that would actually take us from A to B. Function and design that have really gone into this publication were really well thought out and planned. And things like the fold out pages obviously meant that, you know, there had to be compensation for the rest of the pages. So all of the index pages are actually half, half page size to, to ensure that the book doesn't become this, this, this thing that doesn't work properly. So it's really well designed. For me, it really deserves a place in my map collection. I'm really pleased to say that I've still got my copy that I've had for many years. And it is truly out of date, but it doesn't matter to me. Thank you very much. That's all from me. Fascinating, Henry. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly brought back from some memories for me seeing all those uh, <laughs> atlases and various bits and pieces. I remember I, I actually did have a new book of the road AA one. Uh, it was given <laughs> to me as a present a long, long time ago. Yes, fascinating. It's really good. Right. I, I'm conscious of time, but there are a couple of questions uh, in there. So I'm just scrolling back up through. Uh, there we go. So, first one was about uh, Mary. Very interesting. Have you kept copies of all the books and publications you worked on, or just the ones you particularly liked? Well, I've changed my mind on that. So, 
questions, I first read the question, I was going to say yes. But after Henry's talk, I realised I worked on some pages in the Book of the Road and I've forgotten all about those. It was a long time ago, forgive me. So I think I've got most an example of most of the different atlases I've worked on and sheet maps and books, etc. So yes, probably, except for the Book of the Road, obviously. <laughs> You, you have to send the uh, the link for the person who's selling it to Mary uh, Henry so she can buy it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, so another one uh, for Mary. Great to be reminded of working on the Arab School Atlas. It's with you two. I was inspired by the Permagun Atlas. I have a question for you, Mary, around that. Do you actually speak any Arabic? Not a word. Not a word. That I can recognise whether I'm looking at an Arabic script, what it's whether it's correct or not. I yeah. can tell by the shape of the letters, because I'm so used to seeing the, the place names throughout the atlas that I suddenly think, hey, that's not the right name for that. Um, I've lost that ability now, obviously, but no, it was being able to recognise things rather than speak it. No. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, fascinating talk, mate. We'll have to catch up at the conference. Um, Andrew, there was one that I put in for you. Fascinating talk, and, and I do remember seeing some tactile maps uh, um, many years ago. How durable are the points on a tactile map? How, how long do they last, or do they lose their feelability, for want of a better word? Yeah, if we're talking about uh, those made with thermoform, um, they are pretty durable. Uh, you will have seen on um, the, the enlargement that some of the uh, little circles had been sort of slightly dented, uh, yeah, yeah. but the actual um, point uh, braille points are uh, are uh, quite good because they're they're so small that actually there's not much. You, I mean, you, you could push them in but you'd have to actually try to as it were rather than just feeling it with your fingers um on the uh, micro capsule paper one of the concerns with that was that uh it was less durable than uh, the thermoform sort uh, but on the other hand it was easy to make another copy so <laughs> uh, you 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 win on on one side and lose on another i suppose like most things yeah. Um, there was a question uh, to you, Andrew. Have you learned to read Braille yourself? And if so, how difficult did you find it? Uh, I learned, a bit like Mary and her Arabic, I learned to recognise the shapes. Uh, and when I was working, uh, recognise the shapes visually. I never learned to do it tactually. Um, but... Uh, when when I was doing a lot of work with it, then obviously the the shapes became very familiar, and I could um, interpret a, a a name or something like that quite easily. Um, it's it's all quite a long time ago now, uh, so I probably would have to have a refresher course. But um, when people learn Braille, it it's like a lot of things. It's how soon you start if you start as a child uh you pick it up you know within a a to a reasonable degree within a uh, a, a few months uh, if you're beginning as somebody who's maybe had an accident and and got, been blinded uh in later life uh, obviously it takes longer but uh, necessity is uh, a sort of great spur in this uh if people sometimes say blind people must have a very good sense of touch. They have exactly the same sense of touch as we do. It's just that they need to use every clue they can. Um, and uh, so they, you, you concentrate much more on trying to learn Braille, trying to interpret uh, tactile imagery and so forth uh, than somebody who can see and doesn't need to put that effort in. Yeah, uh, it's fascinating. Really interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, Henry, there's a couple of comments. Uh, so I agree with Henry about the AA Book of the Road. Along with the Phillips Atlas, it was a catalyst that made me want to be a cartographer. 
uh, and I spent hours reading them. That was from Rachel. Mary says, uh, Henry, we had subcontracted to Fairley surveys and I worked on some maps in the reader's book of the road. I love the fold out pages too. Yeah, I remember my copy. I don't know if it's stuck away somewhere. I'll have to, I'll have to uh, go through the attic at the weekend. Um, Tim said to you, Henry, uh, glad to see you kept your copy, Henry. I still have my first map I remember purchasing myself. And Paula says, thank you, Evan. Fascinating and thought-provoking talks. And I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I think it's probably time for us to wrap up now because it's gone six o'clock. Uh, I'm still at OS head office. I would imagine that the cleaners are about to want to kick me out of the room that I'm in. Um, so thank you very much and look forward to seeing you in May's Tea Time Talk Map Memoirs.